One year after the launch of the Nintendo Game Boy Color, rumors were going around about a new and improved handheld that was in Nintendo's R&D lab, one that would be a 32-bit system and had online wireless connectivity. When launched in 1998, the Game Boy Color was an 8-bit handheld, so a direct jump to a 32-bit system made many people skeptical. Keep in mind, the Panasonic 3DO, the Sega Saturn and the PlayStation 1 were all 32-bit systems in the household, which had fairly large power requirements at the time. Towards the end of 1999, Nintendo officially announced the new handheld as the Game Boy Advance, and was officially released in the middle of 2001 as part of the sixth generation of home console. So it's 2001, the Game Boy Advance is released and people are in love with the system. It's truly a portable SNES or so we're led to believe, but as we'll see when we take a closer look at the graphics subsystem for the GBA, there's a lot more going on here than meets the eye. The Game Boy Advance is sometimes labeled as the portable Super NES, with 16-bit style graphics, smooth scrolling, mode seven rotation and mosaic effects. It's as though Nintendo managed to shrink down the Super NES hardware into a portable system, but this is not accurate. In fact, both the Super NES and Game Boy Advance are quite different in architecture. The Game Boy Advance, or GBA as it's known, was a massive jump over the Game Boy Color. The processor is an ARM7 TDMI. TDMI stands for Thumb Instructions, Debug Port, fast multiplier, and enhanced ice. While Nintendo used a 32-bit processor in the Virtual Boy, this was the first time it was considered in a handheld and was a big step up from the Game Boy Color. Recall that the Game Boy Color uses an 8-bit sharp processor and ran at 8 megahertz with an enhanced color palette. One of the biggest benefits of the ARM7 processor used in the GBA is the three-stage pipeline. The best way to explain this is, if we consider traditional 8-bit CPUs, the processor would fetch the next instruction, then decode it, and then execute it. This was a top-down sequential process. With a three-stage pipeline like the one found in the GBA, while one instruction is being executed, the next instruction is being decoded, and the next one after that is being fetched, all in parallel. This process is used to increase the speed of flow and allows for operations to take place simultaneously. There are many other benefits of the ARM7 processor found in the GBA, but let's turn our attention over to the graphics. The Game Boy Advance comes with an increased screen resolution over the Game Boy Color at 240 by 160 pixels compared to 160 by 144 of the Game Boy Color. Both systems use a 15-bit color palette or over 32,000 colors. Recall that the Game Boy Color has one background tile layer, one sprite layer, and one window layer, with a maximum of 512 tiles and 40 sprites on screen. To save on space, there is no bitmap mode or the ability to directly plot pixels to a frame buffer at all. But these limitations did not stop the success of the system. In fact, because it was more affordable and already had a huge library of well-known franchises, the Game Boy Color dominated its competition. The Game Boy Advance took inspiration from the Game Boy Color, but also did so much more. First, the ARM7 System on a chip took care of essentially the entire system. Taking a look at the internals of the GBA, you can see it's very simple, with only the AGB ARM chip standing out. Next to that is the 256K of Work RAM or WRAM. We said that the GBA's LCD display is 240 by 160 pixels wide and has a palette of 32,000 colors. It also comes with five independent graphics layers. Just like the Game Boy and Game Boy Color, the GBA uses backgrounds and sprites. And from these five layers, four of them are background layers and one must be a sprite layer. So with four background layers means it's possible to do some cool effects like alpha blending, mosaic, rotation, scaling, and more. In order to facilitate this, the GBA has 96 kilobytes of video RAM, which is a large increase from the Game Boy Color, which had just 16. The GBA screen is scanline based and refreshes at 1 60th of a second or close enough to. The GBA supports a 256 color background palette and a 256 color object or sprite palette, but these palettes can also be split into 16 individual sub palettes for both the backgrounds and sprites. Each of the palettes also has a transparency color defined. Staying true to the Super NES and Game Boy, the GBA uses tiles for each of its four background modes. Each tile is 8 pixels by 8 pixels. You can define the size of the tile maps by the control registers of the GBA. 
Each of the four background layers can be scrolled individually. For example, this intro to Zelda link to the past on the GBA, you can see that backgrounds one and two are moving in completely different directions. With four background layers means the inclusion of parallax scrolling effects is easier to accomplish over the Game Boy Color, which required mid-frame interrupt tricks that manipulated the scan lines. For the first time ever for a Nintendo handheld, the Game Boy Advance introduced bitmap modes. With bitmapping mode, to plot a pixel at location X and Y on the screen, you simply go to that location in memory and fill in the color value. While bitmapping is much easier for the beginner to learn when it came to the Game Boy Advance graphics, they have some limitations that made it difficult for games, but it certainly wasn't impossible. Doom on the GBA used bitmap mode and heavy optimization in order for the game engine to run at a good level of frame rate and performance on the Game Boy Advance. But because of these limitations, almost 90% of Game Boy Advance commercial games utilize tile modes. Tile modes work very similar to the Game Boy Color, 8x8 pixel tile map stored in a memory location that's used to build out the background. This means a total of 30 tiles across by 20 vertically represents a background. The Game Boy Advance also uses sprites. This time around, 128 sprites can be on screen at one time. Sprites are a minimum of 8x8 pixels in size, but with different combinations can go all the way up to 64x64 64 64 pixels in size. Each sprite uses a 256 color palette or one of 16 palettes with 16 colors each. Sprites are controlled by three separate object attributes that handle things like the position, if the sprite is visible, if it's masked, the rotation value, the mosaic effect, its color mode, and more. One of the biggest strengths of the GBA was the variety of games that came out for the system. You had everything from 2D scrollers, SNES ports, 3D games that used 3D engines. Now you're probably wondering, how does the GBA have all this variety and power underneath the hood? Well, it all boils down to two things. The first thing is obviously the ARM7 processor, but Nintendo was smart enough to incorporate six different modes that really determine the type of game that you wanted to develop on the Game Boy Advance. The GBA comes with six different video modes. Each have limitations. Zero, one, and two are the tile-based modes, and three, four, and five are the bitmap modes. It's a trade-off to determine which is the correct mode to use. For example, mode zero has all available four backgrounds, but no ability for rotation and scrolling of these backgrounds. While something like mode two allows for scaling and rotation, but only allows for two backgrounds. Then there are the bitmap modes, which allows for up to 32,000 colors on screen. However, in something like video mode four, where each pixel consists of only eight bits, two pixels must be drawn at a time, which is very slow compared to the tile-based modes. And if we go back and look at the first three tile modes, the resolution is larger than the Game Boy Advance's viewport. This means hardware scrolling can be used, and for something like Mode 3 bitmap mode, this is great for displaying a high color static image. So which mode is considered the best? Well, the answer is neither. It really depends on the game, and that's what makes the GBA such a wonderful handheld. If we consider a scrolling image like this, it's 512 pixels wide by 256 pixels in size, which means that mode 0, 1 or 2 could be used. But attempting to perform this using bitmap mode would consume too much VRAM and then scrolling per pixel would require heavy optimization. So why bother doing this when you can just use tile modes that have hardware scrolling registers? On the flip side, for 3D engines like Raycaster games, Wolfenstein and Doom for example, use of bitmap modes makes more sense. And there are many examples of impressive 3D engines that were developed on the Game Boy Advance that utilize these modes. So we have modes 0 to 5, but what about mode 7, the legendary mode that was found on the Super NES? Where is mode seven? We know that the GBA has the ability to do mode seven style effects, but is there actually mode seven on the GBA? Mode seven on the Super NES is a graphics mode that allows for a single background to be rotated and scaled per scanline to make cool and unique effects like this one found in Super Castlevania four. Hundreds of games made use of this mode and was one of the biggest selling points of the hardware. The term Mode 7 is used when talking about the GBA, but as you've guessed, technically there is no Mode 7 to be found. What's actually happening is the Game Boy Advance comes with a fine background registers, which are separate registers to allow the backgrounds to scale and rotate Mode 7 style. There is also a fine register specifically for sprites. This means sprites can be zoomed, rotated, and scaled in the same way as backgrounds. 
The GBA also has registers for blending and mosaic effects, so with these combinations you can essentially replicate many of the Super NES style Mode 7 effects. This is one of the main reasons why the GBA is considered a handheld Super NES, but in reality, from an architecture standpoint, they really don't have too much in common. It's been almost 22 years since the launch of the GBA and it's truly a classic handheld that took gaming to the next level with its 32-bit processing power, impressive graphical effects and a massive library of games. It took the strength of the Game Boy Color, the Super NES and even introduced bitmap modes from the PC and offered developers many different choices. At the time, it felt like the GBA could do anything and with some of the ports to the system, who could argue? In many ways, it represents the ultimate retro experience and one that I urge anyone to go back and revisit. So there you have it guys, that is the graphics system on the Game Boy Advance. It's a really interesting topic to go back and take a look at. Obviously, Nintendo took all of the great features that were found on the Game Boy line of systems and moved them across to the GBA, yet they incorporated so many cool effects and tricks and tips from the Super NES, as well as additionally adding their own effects exclusively for the GBA and kind of wrap this up into this really powerful handheld that could pretty much do everything. I mean, you could do side-scrolling games, you could do 3D FPS style games, there were racing games. There were so many different things you could do on the GBA and that's really what makes the system so special and so awesome from a retro standpoint. It's such a cool system to go back and revisit and developers really embraced the Game Boy Advance as one of the earliest handhelds used for homebrew and that's definitely something that I want to explore in a future episode on the channel because the homebrew abilities of the Game Boy Advance were some of the most unparalleled things you could do back in 2001 for a handheld system. Well guys, we're going to leave it here for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, you know what to do. Leave me a thumbs up and as always, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.